everyone. Welcome to the week of evolution webinar series. We as Bosch University Science Club Trio of Evolution Committee collaborated with many scientists who are experts in their fields to present an evolution team series to you. We wanted to use the opportunities of the online platform to meet with professors all around the world. Um, our mission was always to spread uh, acute scientific information and create platforms where science can be fully discussed and told. Uh, when the conditions present in our country are taken into account, it is even more crucial to do so. Um, therefore, we would like to restate the necessity for free academy as we still protest and stand against the appointed directors and their undue sanctions. Uh, Bosch University members have been standing against this anti-democratic situation for more than a year. Uh, aside from that, this year we will have nine seminars between 21st of January and 7th of February. You can also follow, your, uh, follow our social media accounts to be posted about calendar. Um, so today we will welcome Professor Steve Brusadi uh, from the University of Edinburgh. After he is done with his uh, presentation, we will have a short question and answer session. You can ask the questions through chat and our team will be edit and direct them to Professor Bursari. Um, welcome again, Professor Bursari. I hope I pronounced your last name. Yeah, yeah very good. Thank you. <laughs> Most yep. people don't pronounce it correctly, so I'm very impressed. Uh, it's a kind of a strange name, but uh, but thank you guys for inviting me. Um, I, I always love it when I hear from students, especially students from around the world that are interested in uh, the research that I do and the books that I write uh, and so on. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, just a nice little honor to be asked. So I really appreciate it. I think what you're doing is very cool as well. You know, have, having um, these talks and inviting scientists from around the world, um, I think it's great to just can, you know, continue your education this way, learn new perspectives, learn about new places. You know, I know it's a very challenging time in our world right now, and it's not always easy for ideas to be freely discussed. So I, I think it's wonderful. And I think it's one of the best things of the pandemic. If there's any good thing, it's that it, it has connected us more with Zoom and, you know, Skype and online ways of meeting each other. So Thank you guys, for, and I'm excited to talk to you. So uh, do you want me to just dive into my presentation? Are you happy for me to do that? Yeah, I think we're good to go. Great. Okay, so you can just start first. whenever you want. Okay. So I'm just going to share the screen now. And... Okay, so I think you should be seeing my screen here. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do is, is talk to you guys today about dinosaurs, and I'm going to try to keep it breezy so, so we have plenty of time for questions before I have to go um, at, the, at the top of the hour. For I have a little two-year-old here, so we start his, his dinner time and his, uh, his bedtime uh, at about six o'clock our time. So we got a good hour here, and I want to talk to you about dinosaurs. So my name is Steve. I'm a professor at the University of Edinburgh. And I'm one of those uh, lucky people who gets to dig up dinosaurs and, and study dinosaurs for a living. And I, uh, I'm not from Scotland. You can maybe tell by the way I talk. Uh, I, I don't sound Scottish. I've lived here about a decade, uh, but, but I grew up in the middle part of the United States. And then I moved out here, and it was a real privilege to, uh, to, to come to Edinburgh and to teach at this university because it's a very old university. It goes back to the 1500s. And the entire science of geology, of, of earth science, as a discipline, it started here. Uh, in Edinburgh. So there's just such a legacy of research on rocks and fossils and earth history and evolution here. Even Charles Darwin went to Edinburgh uh, as a medical student, although he did not finish his degree. <laughs> he, he dropped out because he didn't like blood. Uh, that was a problem. But we have a great legacy here. And so it's a wonderful place to work. Um, now, a few years ago, I published a book on dinosaurs called The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. And, and it was published um, in the US and in the UK. And I was so happy when it was translated into some international editions, including a Turkish edition, which I thought was so cool when this happened. And there's the cover of the book in Turkish. From what I've told, it's a, it's a good translation. And I hope it's a book that um, is accessible to people in Turkey and, and it can maybe do uh, to a lot of young people in Turkey what books like this did for me when I was uh, in high school and at university, when I read so many books and I learned so much about fossils and about uh, science that way. Okay, so 
Look, what I want to do here today, we don't have tons of time, uh, and but I want to tell you a story, and I want to tell you a story that lasts for over 200 million years, and it's a story of the dinosaurs, of course, and it's a story that goes back to when the Earth looked like this. This was about 250 million years ago, the very end of the Permian period. This was a time when all of the land was gathered together into one supercontinent, Pangaea. It stretched from North Pole to South Pole. A very difficult place to live. It was very hot. It was very dry. There was no ice caps on the poles. It was largely a desert world. But a lot of plants and animals were adapted to that world. Of course they were, including many early relatives of ours, early relatives of mammals. But then there was this enormous uh, set of volcanoes that started to erupt in what is now Siberia, in the northern part of Pangaea. And these volcanoes, they spewed out lava and carbon dioxide and other gases for millions of years, and that led to a mass extinction, the worst extinction in the history of the Earth, where maybe up to 95% of all species died out. The closest life ever came to completely dying out ever since it first evolved. But, of course, there were some survivors. And so when I was a student, I became very interested in this extinction, and I started to do a lot of fieldwork in Poland, which is maybe a place you don't think of when you think of fossils and dinosaurs. It maybe doesn't fit that image of what you see on television when paleontologists are digging up fossils. But in reality, we can find fossils anywhere where there's rock of the right age and the right type, usually sandstones, mudstones that formed from floods, from uh, you know fossils being buried and being turned into rock. And Poland has a lot of mud rock layers, layer by layer by layer, that record before the extinction, during the extinction, and after the extinction. And you can look at the fossils in these rocks and you can tell the story of what lived and what died and how the earth recovered. And so in Poland, the kind of fossils we have in these rocks are not normally skeletons. They're not normally the beautiful fossils you see at museums, but they are these types of fossils. They are footprints and handprints that were left behind by the animals living at that time. And within just one million years or so after the extinction, we start to see these tiny little tracks. There's a footprint here and there's a handprint there. That, by the way, sorry. Uh, and so these are tiny, just a few centimeters. They're just about the size of a, a cat's paw prints. And they were made by an animal that would have looked something like this, a small little thing about the size of a house cat. You could hold this animal in your arms. And this may not look like a very special animal, but in fact, it is a very special animal because this is essentially the ancestor of the dinosaurs. This is a type of reptile that survived the extinction and proliferated afterwards. And it doesn't look anything like a T-Rex or a Brontosaurus, but from small things, great things come. And this was the humble origin of dinosaurs, this fast moving reptile with long skinny arms and legs. But it took a long time for these first dinosaurs to become dominant. It's not that they just took over the world right away because there were many other species that were evolving during this time, during what we call the Triassic period, the time after the extinction. Because so many things died in the extinction, there were so many opportunities for new species. And this is when the first mammals lived, the first pterodactyls, the first turtles, and of course the first dinosaurs. And these first dinosaurs were not very impressive. They were not very big. Mostly they were the size of cats and dogs. And there were other animals that were superior to them. There were other animals that ruled the world. And we found some of their fossils in Portugal, in the Triassic rocks of Portugal. And we have in Portugal a site where there are dozens, probably hundreds of skeletons that go into a hillside. And these skeletons are of the animals that ruled the lakes and the rivers at the time that these first dinosaurs were living. And they were not dinosaurs, they were these types of animals. They were amphibians, basically salamanders, that were the size of cars. And there were hundreds of these things that formed flocks that lived in the rivers and the lakes. And if you were one of those small little dinosaurs, you would have wanted to avoid the water because these guys would have been there to eat you. 
but it wasn't any better on dry land because on land, it was the realm of the crocodiles. And back in the Triassic period, there were so many different types of crocodiles, so many more than today. There were crocs that were nearly the size of buses. There were crocs that had armor and spikes all over their bodies. There were crocs that had no teeth. They had beaks like a turtle or like a bird. There were even crocs that only walked on their hind legs. And, and th they were so much more diverse, so much more abundant than the dinosaurs. So really the dinosaurs were role players. They were the, the minor actors in the Triassic world. However, that would not last. That lasted for a good 30 or 40 million years. And dinosaurs were small and humble for that time, but then something happened. And this allowed dinosaurs to finally have their opportunity. And what happened was that supercontinent of Pangaea, it started to break apart about 200 million years ago at the end of the Triassic period. And as it did so, North America separated from Europe, South America separated from Africa, and the gaps between those continents today is the Atlantic Ocean. But before water came in to fill those gaps, the earth bled lava. It was another time of big volcanoes, and it was another time of all kinds of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, global warming, another mass extinction, and a lot of species died. So many of those crocodiles were killed, leaving only a few species, which are the ancestors of today's crocodiles. And most of those giant amphibians were killed too. But surprisingly, the dinosaurs were the great survivors of that extinction. We don't know why. I wish I could tell you why. It would make the story so much cleaner and clearer. But the reality is this is one of the biggest mysteries that remains about dinosaurs. What was it that allowed them to survive 200 million years ago with these big volcanoes when so many of the other animals of the time died? Could they grow faster? Could they run faster? Who knows? We don't know. I'm sure somebody, though, from the new generation of paleontologists, a brilliant young student, will figure this out. But what we do know is, after that extinction ended, the next interval of time began, and that is what we call the Jurassic period. And this is when dinosaurs properly took over the world. This is why they call it Jurassic Park and not Triassic Park. Triassic Park would be a book or a movie about crocodiles and giant salamanders, a cool film, I think, but it wouldn't really be a dinosaur film. But in the Jurassic is when dinosaurs spread around the world, diversified into all types of species, and became truly giant animals. And this is when you see the first giant long neck dinosaurs. You see meat-eating dinosaurs the size of buses. You see dinosaurs with horns and spikes and frills and duck bills and all these other fantastic features that we know and love about dinosaurs. This only happened in the Jurassic period as dinosaurs spread around the world. And we are finding more dinosaurs than ever before. We really are in the golden age of dinosaur research right now. Somewhere around the world, somebody is finding a new species of dinosaur on average once every single week. So there are more than 50 new species found every year. And the reason is really simple. Paleontology used to be a very narrow discipline. There were very few professional paleontologists. It was mostly people, let's face it, in the, the wealthy or the posh universities in the U.S. and Great Britain and Western Europe that study paleontology. There were just a few paleontologists in, in many other countries, but now the field has expanded. It's diversified. There are so many young paleontologists all over the world, but especially in these enormous developing, growing countries like China and Argentina and Brazil and South Africa and Mongolia and so on. And that's why there are so many more fossils being found. So many people are out looking. And in fact, we are finding so many new dinosaurs that we're even finding them right here in Scotland, probably another place that you might not think of when you think of fossils and dinosaurs. It does not fit the stereotype of what you see on television. Scotland is not a dry desert where somebody goes out and brushes the sand off a dinosaur bone. Scotland is a much different country, but a beautiful country in its own way. And there's one particularly beautiful place where we can find dinosaurs. And that is an island off the west coast of Scotland. This island right here is called the Isle of Skye. It is an enchanting place. 
It looks like something out of a fantasy novel, out of Lord of the Rings or something like that. And this is the one place in Scotland where there are good rocks from the Jurassic period, and those rocks have fossils in them, including the dinosaurs. Now, I bring my students to Sky every year. We haven't been able to go during the pandemic, but hopefully we'll get back again soon. And it's my students that always find the best fossils. And this is the best example of that. This is Amelia in the center of the photo there. And a few years ago, we were on Sky, and she came across a jaw sticking out of the rocks, and it turned out to be the head of a pterodactyl, one of those flying reptiles that lived with the dinosaurs. And that head led to a skeleton, and it's a beautiful fossil. And three weeks from now, three weeks from today, or three weeks from tomorrow, actually, we are going to announce that new skeleton as a new species of pterodactyl. We're going to unveil it at the National Museum of Scotland. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And if you see that in the news, remember, this was Amelia, our student, who found this fossil. Now, I, when we take our students to Sky, our students get to train in all kinds of techniques for collecting fossils. This is Moji, who came from uh, Nigeria to study with us. And she studied uh, the fishes, the little fishes that lived in the rivers and the lakes uh, with the dinosaurs. And here she is using a little angle grinder to cut the fish bones out of the rock. But for dinosaurs, we need bigger tools. And here's Doogie Ross, who's a friend of ours. He's from the Isle of Skye. He grew up on the island. He speaks the native language of the island as his first language. And he is a builder by trade. He built his own museum on the island. And here he is using one of his saws to cut this dinosaur bone out of the rock. Now I could talk about Sky forever. I love working there. But I want to tell you just one story of what I think is our most important discovery, at least until Amelia found that pterodactyl. And this was a discovery we made about five years ago up on the northern tip of the island on this beach. Now you can see in this photo here, it's sunny. The sky is blue. It's, it's gorgeous. And this isn't what Scotland's normally like. Usually it's raining, it's cloudy. So you might think, well, why am I up here taking a photograph and not looking for fossils? And the reason is because it is high tide. The waves are lapping up onto the beach. And we have to wait until low tide to look for fossils because then that beach turns into a rock platform that juts out into the Atlantic Ocean. And we went there one day to look for bones because a geologist friend of ours found a tiny little jawbone and we thought there might be more. And we spent all day looking on our hands and knees for any bones we can find, and we didn't find anything. It was a really frustrating day, but that happens a lot. You know, we don't normally find new species of dinosaur. It takes time, it takes patience. But we were frustrated. We started to walk back to our cars, and as we did so, we started to notice that there were these big holes in the rock, and they were full of seaweed and full of crabs and barnacles and, and other sea life. But then we started to notice there were a lot of these holes. There were over a hundred of them. And some of them formed a pattern. They formed a bit of a left-right, left-right zigzaggy sequence. We could see some of them from the side, and we could see they were actually impressed into the rock. So they must have formed before that rock was rocked, back when it was still soft sand. Something was impressing into that sand. And then we can see that some of them had bits sticking out from one end, one, two, three, four. Others were paired. There was a bigger horseshoe-shaped one, a smaller crescent-shaped one in front. And they were big. Each one was the size of a car tire. And it dawned on us after a few moments that, wait a minute, this was actually a really good day. We actually did find fossils, but not fossil bones or skeletons. These were fossil footprints and handprints. So much bigger than the ones in Poland because we're now in the Jurassic period and dinosaurs are getting bigger, much bigger. And there's really only one type of dinosaur, one type of animal that's ever lived in the entire history of the earth that was so big that it would make a hole the size of a car tire every time its hand or foot hit the ground. And that is this type of dinosaur, the giant long-necked sauropod dinosaurs, things like Brontosaurus and Diplodocus. And the sauropod that made those tracks on the Isle of Skye in the Jurassic period, 170 million years ago, at that point in time, it was the biggest animal that had ever lived on Earth. 
It was the size of about three elephants put together. Now, the more we go to Sky, the more we find, the more fossils we find, especially the more track sites. And my student Paige, she's an expert on using drones to map these track sites. And so Paige has used drones to map not just that one site with the sauropod tracks, but many other sites. And what Paige has found is there's actually a huge number of dinosaurs that left their handprints and footprints. There were big long neck dinosaurs. There were meat eating dinosaurs that were early cousins of T-Rex. There were stegosaurs, the dinosaurs with plates on their backs. There were duck billed dinosaurs, which ate plants with their beaks and so on. So there was a very diverse ecosystem of these dinosaurs in the Jurassic period. And this is what we imagine their world would have been like. This is artwork showing some of these dinosaurs walking out into shallow water after a storm in search of food. And these are those giant long neck dinosaurs. And here, watching them is a different type of dinosaur. A dinosaur we also have footprints of, but only footprints because its hands were too short to touch the ground. This was a dinosaur that walked only on its back legs. And this was, believe it or not, an early cousin of T-Rex. And we have better fossils of skeletons of these dinosaurs from other parts of the world, including this one called Guanlong, which is from China. And this primitive tyrannosaur, an ancestor of T-Rex, it lived 100 million years before T-Rex, and it doesn't look much like T-Rex. This animal was only the size of a human. It was no bigger than me. But it was from these small ancestors that the giant tyrannosaurs would later evolve. And so why was that? Why did tyrannosaurs get so big? Well, we have a new clue from a new species of tyrannosaur that comes from another new frontier in dinosaur research. This comes from Uzbekistan in Central Asia. And this is a species called Timurlengia, and we named it a few years ago. And it's very important because it is an intermediate species. In age, it is kind of in between the first Jurassic tyrannosaurs and then things like T. rex, which lived at the very end of the time of dinosaurs. And it also is intermediate in size. The first tyrannosaurs were the size of humans. Timurlengia was the size of a horse. T. rex was the size of a bus. Now, what's really interesting about Timurlengia is this is one of his fossils. This is the back of a skull. And this hole is where the spinal cord goes into the brain. Now, we can put that skull into a CAT scanner. We can use the x-rays to build digital models of the brain. This is what the back end of a tyrannosaur brain looks like. The blue part is the brain. This bit in pink that looks like a pretzel, that is the ear. And this tells us a few very important things. First of all, this animal had a big brain for a, a reptile the size of a horse. So it was a smart dinosaur, much smarter than we usually think dinosaurs were. And secondly, this ear, we, this part of the ear is the cochlea, the part that hears sound. We know from modern animals that the longer the cochlea, the greater range of sounds you can hear. And this dinosaur has a very long cochlea. So what this tells us is that tyrannosaurs were becoming smarter and developing very keen senses while they were still pretty small, only the size of horses. And then later on, a lot of their competitors died. And that's what allowed T. rex to rise to the top of the food chain. And what makes T. rex such an amazing dinosaur is not only that it's really big. It was the size of a bus. Its head was the size of a bathtub. It did crush the bones of its prey. That is all true. But T. rex was also smart. It inherited that big brain and those keen senses of hearing, but also smell and eyesight from its ancestors. And so those smaller ancestors were probably evolving greater intelligence in order to survive in the shadows. But then when they had the opportunity to go to the top of the food chain, they did. And what made T. rex so amazing was that it combined huge size with high intelligence. And to me, that makes T-Rex the most amazing dinosaur. Now, while T-Rex and other tyrannosaurs were getting bigger and bigger over time, 
one other group of dinosaurs was getting smaller and smaller over time. And these were the raptor dinosaurs. And this right here is Velociraptor, the real Velociraptor. Now, I know we have an image from Jurassic Park, and it doesn't look like this. The Jurassic Park Velociraptor is green. It's covered in scales. It looks like a, a big lizard or a big crocodile, whereas this Velociraptor is colorful, and it has feathers on its body, and it even has wings on its arms. This is the real Velociraptor, and we know this because of actual fossils. And these fossils were first discovered in 1996, which was three years after Jurassic Park came out. So when Jurassic Park was made, the filmmakers had no idea dinosaurs had feathers. They just missed it by a few years, but we now know. And these fossils come from a place in China called Liaoning in northeastern China on the border with North Korea. It's a land of factories, a land of hills, and a land of a lot of farms. And it was in the mid 90s, the middle 1990s, that farmers started to find these types of things when they were out working their land and they started to split open the rocks. And these were skeletons of dinosaurs covered in feathers. Beautiful fossils. And we now, nearly three decades later, have thousands of these dinosaurs dozens of different species that had feathers. And they tell an amazing story. First of all, they prove that today's birds evolved from dinosaurs. This was an idea that goes back to the time of Charles Darwin, but people debated it for a long time. But once feathers were found on dinosaurs, that finished the debate because feathers are so intricate, so detailed, and they're only seen in today's birds. So first of all, these fossils tell us, yes, birds evolved from dinosaurs. And then secondly, these fossils tell us how birds evolved from dinosaurs and how birds started to fly. And the amazing thing that we see from these fossils in China, we have so many of them because entire ecosystems were buried by volcanoes. That means we have meat eaters and plant eaters. We have small dinosaurs and big dinosaurs. And almost all of them have some type of feather on their body. This is part of the tail of a tyrannosaur. These are two of the tail bones. And these things that look like scratches in the rock, they are feathers. And most dinosaurs have these type of feathers. But as you can see, these are simple feathers. They look like hair. They're just little individual strands. There's no way that these dinosaurs could have flown with these feathers any more than we can fly with our hair. So feathers must have evolved very early on in dinosaur evolution for a very different purpose. And we think dinosaurs evolved feathers for the same reason that mammals evolved hair, and that is to keep their bodies warm. And most dinosaurs kept these simple feathers, but one group of dinosaurs, the raptors, started to change their feathers. And as the raptors' bodies got smaller and smaller, those feathers got more densely packed across the body. They started to line up those feathers on their arms. Those feathers got longer. Those feathers started to branch out until they flattened out and formed quill pen feathers, the same types of feathers that make up the wings of birds today. And this right here is a fossil wing. Look at all these feathers attaching to the arm and the hand, just like in a bird today. However, this is not a bird. This is a raptor dinosaur. It is this raptor dinosaur, which I was very privileged to study a few years ago, invited by my Chinese colleagues uh, to, to describe with them. And we called it Zhenwan Long, and here it is in all of its beauty. This is a, a dinosaur that's about the size of a big dog and has feathers all over its body. Here's a wing. Here's the other wing. This was a dinosaur with not only feathers, but with true wings. But its wings were too small to, to allow it to fly. Its body was too big. Its wings were too small. It'd be like an airplane trying to fly with tiny little wings. It just wouldn't happen. So these fossils, like Gen Long, tell us that even wings did not first evolve for flying. And we think that wings probably first evolved as display structures, as, as basically as billboards sticking out of the arms 
to attract mates and to scare away rivals. Now, if you saw Zhen Wanlong and some of these raptor dinosaurs alive, they would have looked something like this. And I think you would have just considered them to be some type of weird bird, a scary bird with really sharp claws and teeth, but a strange bird nonetheless. Not that much weirder than a turkey or an ostrich or an emu. But we don't call them birds simply because they were too big and their wings were too small for them to fly. But you could imagine evolution making just a few little changes, making the body smaller, making the wing bigger until you get an animal like this, that once it flapped those wings, those wings would help keep it in the air. They would provide some lift and some thrust. And at that point, dinosaurs had started flying. And natural selection could fine tune them into ever better flyers. Now, I know it's a weird thing to think about. Today's birds evolved from dinosaurs. That means they are dinosaurs. Now, I know they don't look anything like T-Rex or anything like Brontosaurus, but they are dinosaurs. And the best analogy is bats. Bats are mammals. Of course bats are mammals. They have hair. They feed their babies milk. They do all the things mammals do. They are part of the mammal family tree. It's just that bats are a weird type of mammal that got small, evolved wings, and developed the ability to fly. And birds are the dinosaur equivalent of that. They are just a weird type of dinosaur that got small, evolved wings, and developed the ability to fly. And that means that when all the other dinosaurs died, birds survived, that means that dinosaurs really do live on as over 10,000 species of modern day birds. And some of them are majestic, like the bald eagle. Others are the total opposite. If you go to the beach, one of these seagulls comes down, they try to steal your ice cream, steal your chips. I think, as annoying as that is, I think you can sense in that moment the inner velociraptor in a seagull. And that's because seagulls are dinosaurs. They have dinosaur blood in their veins. They are part of the dinosaur family tree. So dinosaurs still do live today. We have to remember this. We have to celebrate this. But it's also true that most of the dinosaurs died. And all of the other dinosaurs, except for birds, they died out 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous period. That's the time after the Jurassic. And by that time, the continents had moved around until the world looked like this. You could tell the world is starting to look more modern. And it was one day, 66 million years ago, that this giant asteroid fell out of the sky. It was a rock that was 10 kilometers wide, traveling faster than an airplane. It smashed into the Earth with the force of over 1 billion nuclear bombs put together and it punched a hole in the crust over 150 kilometers wide. And that hole, you can still see it in Mexico today. This was devastating. The world changed in a moment. This was the biggest asteroid to hit the Earth at least in the last half a billion years. This was no normal day. And there were wildfires and tidal waves and earthquakes, all kinds of chaos. And then all the dust from the collision, went into the atmosphere, blocked out the sun, plunged the world into darkness. Plants could not photosynthesize. Because of that, they died. And then the plant eaters died. And then the meat eaters that ate the plant eaters died. And whole food chains collapsed. Many dinosaurs were there to witness it. T-Rex was alive the day the asteroid hit. Triceratops was, duck-built dinosaurs were. And they could not cope with such sudden devastation. They had ruled the world for over 150 million years, but when the planet changed so quickly that day, the dinosaurs could not cope. And now, as I continue my research, I'm becoming more and more interested in what happened after the dinosaurs died. Why did some animals survive? How did they then prosper in a new world as the Earth healed from that horrible day? And so I've spent a lot of time in New Mexico, out in the desert. This does look more like the paleontology you see on television. And we are out there. This is one of the best records in the world of the fossils of the animals that took over from the dinosaurs. 
And so I take my students to New Mexico. This is Sarah, who is my very first PhD student. She's now a postdoc in my lab. And I also have a big team of students now, four PhD students uh, and three postdocs who are all working on this question of what happened after the end Cretaceous extinction when the dinosaurs died. And Sarah has very quickly become one of the world's experts in those animals that took over from the dinosaurs. We start to find a lot of their fossils in New Mexico, and their fossils look like this. And these might look kind of familiar to you because you have these types of things in your mouth. These are teeth, but these are not the teeth of T-Rex that look like a, a little knife. These are the teeth of mammals, the molar teeth and premolar teeth of mammals, with all the different valleys and ridges and mounds on them. So it was the mammals that took over from the dinosaurs. Actually, most mammals died with the asteroid, but some of them did survive, and then they had a new world to prosper in. And not too long after the asteroid in New Mexico, we start to find the bones of this mammal. It's a small one, just about the size of a house cat. You could fit it into your arms. It had long arms and legs, but it had long fingers and toes. It could grab onto the branches. And this was a primate one of our earliest ancestors, which just goes to show that we only got our opportunity because the dinosaurs died. If that asteroid didn't hit, animals like this early primate would not have been able to evolve and we would not be here today, which goes to show how connected all of this is. We think of dinosaurs as these animals that lived millions of years ago, totally unrelated to our world today, but in fact, they live on as birds, and if the other dinosaurs didn't die, we would have never had our opportunity. So with that, I'd just like to thank all of you. And very happy now to take any questions that uh, any of you guys have. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, look forward to hearing what you think. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Not surprisingly, it was very informative, explanatory, and uh, of course, it was very fascinating. Uh, we have already read your, read your book, The Rise and the Fall of the Dinosaurs, with great pleasure. And during the pre presentation, uh, our team compiled the questions from the chat. We would like to forward some of them without taking much of your time. So um, we can start a few. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, first, I would like to thank you so much for the great talk. I mean, the topic itself is already interesting. And when it combines with your storytelling skills, it gets even better. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, this is actually uh, one of my questions. So um, you mentioned about T-Rex in your presentation for a little bit. Um, I'm not sure, but I think there's this debate that has been going on uh whether it had uh feathers or not uh, mm -hmm. and if it did have feathers uh how do we know about it and what evolutionary advantages that the feathers provide for t-rex yep great question and this comes up a lot especially when you see t-rex in movies or on tv this idea you know how should we make it look and we and you know with with jurassic world this is a, a question <laughs> that we always have to deal with um we don't know the exact answer. We don't know for sure if T-Rex had feathers or not. And that's simply because T-Rex fossils are found preserved in a certain way. T-Rexes lived in these environments. They lived in forests and they lived near rivers. And when some of them would die, they would get buried by the mud or the sand and turned into a fossil that way. Usually that type of preservation only preserves the bones. You don't get muscles, skin, feathers, or any of the you know, soft tissues. In China, we're very lucky because these volcanoes buried these entire ecosystems, which was horrible for the dinosaurs, but it was kind of like Pompeii in Italy, where the, all those people you know, were killed by Mount Vesuvius. They, they were killed by the volcano and, and encased in ash, and they were preserved that way. So for those dinosaurs in, in China, the feathers did not have a chance to decay. They were preserved in place. But for T-Rex, we're not so lucky. So we don't know either way. But what we do know is that there are other tyrannosaurs in China buried by those volcanoes that did have feathers. 
And so that means undoubtedly that the ancestors of T. rex had feathers. So for me, the simplest conclusion is that T. rex itself probably had feathers. Either that or it lost feathers. And that, that can happen. Things are lost during evolution. But when you think about mammals and hair, all mammals have some type of hair. Even dolphins have little whiskers and stuff, you know, especially when they're babies. Even elephants, which are so big that, you know, they don't want to have too much hair or else they would overheat. They still have some hair. Why? Because their ancestors had hair and they retain that hair. They use it in some way. So my best guess is that T-Rex probably did have feathers, but they were probably very simple feathers. Certainly T-Rex was not flying. It wouldn't have had wings or anything like that, but it probably had those simple little feathers. Maybe it helped, you know, the T-Rex stay warm. More likely they could have used them for display, or maybe their feathers were really, really, really tiny, like, you know, the hair of an elephant, but they were still there. That's my guess. And my, my, Prediction is that somebody will find a fossil of a T-Rex that is preserved in that perfect way that will show feathers. I think that will happen. And whoever does it, they're going to have the cover of nature or science. You know, it'll be, be that kind of a find. So that's the long answer to, to that question, which I hope makes sense. Yeah, thank you so much for your answer. Professor Bursat, I would like to thank you for your inspirational talk. Uh, there's a question like that. What do you think might be the reasons why dinosaurs could not exist in the seas? Oh, that's oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'll just start out by saying. Um, but it's it's a real mystery because dinosaurs live for a long time. I mean, they're still alive as birds, but they really ruled the earth for over 150 million years. And they evolved so many things. I mean, you know, they, they became the largest animals to ever live on land. Some of them became the size of, of Boeing 737 airplanes. You know, other ones became tiny little animals that could burrow into the mud. There were dinosaurs that could run. There were dinosaurs that could climb. There, of course, were dinosaurs that started to fly. But the one thing dinosaurs never did, as best we can tell, is go into the water, fully into the water, like a whale or something like that. Now, mammals have done this. Mammals have done this many times. Whales, manatees, you know, so on. And many other reptiles did this. You know, there were all these reptiles living in the ocean when dinosaurs were on land. They were distant cousins, but they all evolved from land ancestors. So things like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs and pliosaurs. There were even crocodiles in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous that fully lived in the ocean. They looked like whales, these crocodiles. So why did dinosaurs not do this when so many other animals did, including other reptiles? And I think there's two possibilities. I think one, maybe there were just so many other reptiles already in the water that dinosaurs didn't have the space to evolve there. Maybe it was what we call an incumbency problem. The second explanation is that there was something about dinosaurs, about the way they grew, about the way they reproduced, about the way they moved, that prevented them from easily moving into the water. And I don't know. I don't know what that could be. I, I don't know. You guys would probably have as good of an idea as me. It, it's a total mystery to me. A total mystery, which makes it kind of fun. Thank you for your answer. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this enlightening presentation. And here's a question. Uh, do fossils allow us to do population studies on dinosaurs? On dinosaurs? Not easily. Not easily. I mean, so, so some fossils do allow population studies. And ultimately, we would love that, right? Because that's how we can really study evolution. You want to look at entire populations. You want to see what the variation is in those populations, how that changes over time or across space, because evolution happens at the population level. Um, with some fossils, we can do that. I mean, there's fossil corals and clams um, and, and, and you know, other ocean animals that there's, there's thousands, sometimes even millions of specimens, and you can do that kind of work. With dinosaurs, it's very hard. Uh, usually it's just um, there's, you know, a few fossils of, of any given dinosaur. And there are there are hundreds of dinosaur species that are known from only one single fossil. So 
it's tricky. And there are a few dinosaurs where there are a lot of specimens. T. rex is one of them. I wouldn't say we have a good population level understanding of T. rex, but there have been more than 50 skeletons of T. rex that have been found, including, you know, very big, old, full-grown adults all the way down to quite young juveniles. So although it's not a single population, we at least have some information on, you know, the, in, the spread of the entire species and how they grew and, and, and so on. Um, but it does make me frustrated, really, as a biologist, that there's certain things we can't easily know about dinosaurs because we have so few fossils. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, while mass extinctions occurred after volcanic activities in the Triassic period, how did the evolutionary process on dinosaurs accelerate? Um, what were the advantages? Yeah, I, you know, this is the, the, the big mystery that I, that I mentioned, and, and I, I also don't have a good answer for this. What I do know is that when those volcanoes erupted at the end of the Triassic, as the supercontinent broke apart, it was about 600,000 years of big eruptions. And this led to global warming because all the carbon dioxide that came from those eruptions had heated up the earth and a lot of things died. And the crocodiles and the amphibians were hit really hard. Now, the dinosaurs weren't. The dinosaurs seemed to have barely noticed that extinction. All the major types of dinosaurs that lived in the Triassic, they continued into the Jurassic. And why is that? I don't know. However, what we do know is that after the extinction, when we get into the Jurassic period, then evolution does seem to speed up. It seems to be quite quickly you start getting bigger dinosaurs. Probably because all these crocs and giant salamanders have died. So there's empty space, there's opportunity. But it does seem like evolution sped up early on in the Jurassic and dinosaurs took advantage and they especially got bigger. The biggest Triassic dinosaur was about the size of a giraffe. And then in the Jurassic within, it's hard to say, but you know, probably within at most 5 million years or so, you know, you start to see dinosaurs that were the size of several elephants put together. So it looks like they started to get big pretty fast after that extinction. But there's still so much we don't know about that end Triassic extinction. Thank you. Professor Bursati, do you think being successful in terms of evolution is about being able to exist today or how long you can survive? I think success is one of those words that means different things to different people. And, you know, I mean, I say the dinosaurs were successful because they lived, you know, so long and they still continue today. Um, but, you know, are dinosaurs more successful than mammals or less? You know, those are value judgments. But what I would say is that certainly there have been many groups of animals and plants in Earth history that were very successful in their own time, but they do not continue today. I mean, certainly T. rex was a very successful animal. It was enormous. It was the only big predator in its ecosystem. It evolved such a strong bite that it crushed the bones of its prey. It grew so fast, it put on about two kilos every single day for 10 years as a teenager. I mean, those that's success. That's an animal that's finally adapted to its world, but yet it died out. And why did it die out? Because the asteroid came down and the rules of the game changed so quickly. And the things that made T-Rex so successful in the stable world of the Cretaceous now may have been handicaps when climates and environments change so quickly. And it does seem like with that extinction, when the asteroid hit, the surviving animals were mostly ones that were small and could eat lots of different foods. And they could hide out in the water, like in rivers or in lakes. T-Rex couldn't do those things. So certainly T-Rex was successful for a long time, but then in that moment of change, it lost its advantages. But I would still say it's successful. I mean, the earth is so old, evolutions happen you know, for such a long time, and the present day is only one vantage point for us to look at. Thank you for the answer. Uh, we do have another question. 
Has the evolutionary process of dinosaurs' nutrition developed through herb herbivorism to carnivorism? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, there were lots of different dinosaurs that ate different foods. And of course, some were specialized in eating meat, like T-Rex, let's say. No way T-Rex was eating leaves <laughs> and flowers and stuff. You know, other ones ate plants. And they ate different plants, too, because, you know, plants changed over time. So a brontosaurus that lived in the Jurassic period never would have seen a flower or a fruit. Those plants were not around them. They only evolved in the Cretaceous period. So Triceratops would have eaten fruits and flowers, but Triceratops would have never seen a blade of grass. Grasslands came after the dinosaurs. So dinosaurs were constantly changing their diets. But early on in dinosaur evolution, it seems like probably the ancestral dinosaur was a meat eater, probably, but people have started to find more fossils of close relatives of dinosaurs, and some of those are plant eaters. So I think it's actually unclear now what the first dinosaurs did. And it may have been that the first dinosaurs already had a diversity of diets. And that could be part of the reason why they became so successful, is that they were able to change their diets to match their environments. Thank you. Um, so this question is kind of related to uh, the question that Bora asked. So um, if the asteroid didn't hit, would I mean, at that time, how they were doing in terms of uh, evolutionary success, uh, would they still be able to survive? I think so. I think if the asteroid did not hit, you would still have lots of dinosaurs, not just birds, but lots of other dinosaurs. Now, you wouldn't necessarily have T-Rex and Triceratops because, you know, they lived 66 million years ago. Evolution's always working. Certainly evolution would have produced new dinosaurs. But I think we would still be in the age of dinosaurs, which means dinosaurs would probably still be the biggest animals. They'd still be the most diverse animals in the food web. And mammals would probably still be very small because mammals did live with dinosaurs all the way back to the Triassic period. But when dinosaurs got big, mammals stayed small. And there was never a mammal bigger than a badger that ever lived with a, a dinosaur before the, the asteroid. Hit. So I think if that asteroid did not strike, that world would have generally continued. Now, the dinosaurs, though, that survived would have been faced with a lot of new challenges. And biggest of all is that the climate has changed a lot over the last 66 million years. When the dinosaurs died, when the asteroid hit, the Earth was really hot. There was no ice at the poles. It was much warmer than today. But over the last 66 million years, first of all, temperatures got even higher. The earth almost boiled you know, early on, but then temperatures started to decrease. And then of course we entered an ice age. And so dinosaurs would have had to deal with all that. And maybe, maybe some of those climate changes could have strongly affected them. But I do think that it would still be a dinosaur world if it wasn't for that asteroid. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your time. We deeply, we deeply appreciate for your um, contribution to the series, and it was very, it was an honor for us. As we saying goodbye to you, we kindly re request the viewers to stay with us if they would like to join the prized codes. And again, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. You know, I appreciate it, and and um, like I said, you know, it, it, it's a nice thing to make connections with people around the world and to be invited to do things like this. So I'm just really touched that you guys, um, you know, heard about my work and heard about the book and, and asked to invite me. So um, best of luck with your studies and with, with your own lives and science. Uh, there's so much more to discover out there. And it's such a, an amazing and rewarding field of work to be in for both a career and also as a hobby, you know, so, so best of luck, keep in touch, maybe see some of you guys in Edinburgh, we have a great master's course here, you know, for paleontology and PhD course and so on, and many other courses, we have great postdocs that come from around the world. So if you ever find yourself here, let me know. Uh, otherwise, stay safe and stay healthy and stay well and uh, keep on keeping on through the pandemic and everything that's going on. So you too. All right. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye. Um, Steve Bruce had seen 
bugün anlattıkları ve e, Ali'nin ufak derlediği sorularla birlikte bir kağıt quizimiz var. Deniz istersen o zaman denizdeyiz. Oyun kodunu girerek ya da kayı kodu okutarak sanırım quizde giriş yapabilirsiniz. Deniz mikrofonu açabilirsin. Kendi isimlerinizle girerseniz daha iyi olur çünkü ona göre bir sıralama çıkacak. Hemen dünkü ufak aksaklık için de özür dileyim ufak bir kanıt konusunda yaşadığımız. Buradan da ekibimizden Cansu'ya teşekkür ederim. Bugün kanıt onun sayesinde gerçekleştirebiliyoruz. Birkaç dakika daha bekleyelim istersen Deniz. Üç dakika falan. Sonra başlatalım. Maç. Bir saniye hemen tekrar ekran paylaşacağım. Bir iki dakika daha bekleyip başlayalım isterseniz. Başlatabilirsin diyeceğim ama sürekli birileri de geliyor. <gülüyor> Sana bırakıyorum. 30 saniye daha bekleyelim. <gülüyor> Sen 
birini kaybettik. O zaman başlatıyorum şimdi quiz. Sonuçlar geliyor. Ee, bu kişinin kim olduğunu <gülüyor> nasıl öğreneceğiz hiçbir fikrim yok ama şu an yorumlarını da yazabilir bence. Ya da Instagram hesabımızdan da bize ulaşabilir. Hepinize katıldığınız için çok teşekkür ederiz. Bence çok keyifli bir yayın oldu. Ben gerçekten bu yayında bayağı eğlendim. Sizin söyleyecek bir şeyiniz var mı? Aliye çok teşekkür ederiz Kavut için. Ve Steve Brissett'i bize önerdiği için, evrim haftası için. Ya ben teşekkür ederim. Ben de çok eğlendim. Hem konuşmada hem Kavut'ta. Umarım izleyiciler de e, keyif alarak izlemişlerdir. Diğer yayınlarımız için takipte kalın. <gülüyor> o zaman görüşürüz.